Hello and welcome to Mr. Quickest Teachers. In today's lesson, I'll be providing a detailed analysis of the poem The Three Fates by Rosemary Dobson. My analysis will be presented with rolling annotations of the stanzas, lines, and important words and phrases in the poem. I'll emphasize the themes, literary devices, both figurative and poetic, tone, structure, language, or diction of the poem. To purchase the course that provides stanza by stanza, line by line, and word for word, written and video analysis of all the 15 poems in the IGCSE anthology, visit mrquakersteaches.com. The written course has been particularly helpful to students sitting in the IGCSE because it gives clear guidance on the approved writing styles. Without further ado, let's demystify the three fates by Rosemary Dobson. Let's begin by speaking about the poet. Rosemary Dobson was born on the 18th of June, 1920, and she's passed, or she died on the 27th of June, 2012. She was 92 years old. Dobson was an Australian poet, illustrator, editor, and anthologist. The poem, The Three Fates, is made up of five stanzas, all cassettes. Or three lines and the poem deals with the experience of a man who is miraculously rescued from death by the three sisters the three sisters is a motif that runs in literature especially in shakespeare's macbeth where macbeth meets the three sisters and then his life or the three witches and his life is never remains the same so in this poem we're going to see the infusion of the supernatural superstition and some of the ideas that run in Greek mythology and some of the ill effects of the man's prayer for immortality and how the, 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 the three sisters effectively made his life a botched life full of negative and very very um, almost like, tum like tumultuous and torturous living experience. Let's begin by reading the poem, The Three Fates, by Rosemary Dobson. The Three Fates, Rosemary Dobson. At the instant of drowning, invoke the three sisters. It was a mistake, an aberration, to cry out for life everlasting. He came up like a cock and back to the river bank, put on his clothes in reverse order, returned to the house. He suffered the enormous agonies of passion, writing poems from the end backwards, brushing away tears that had not yet fallen, loving her wildly as the day regressed towards morning. He watched her, swinging in the garden, growing younger, barefoot, straw-hearted. And when she was gone, and the house, and the swing, and daylight, there was an instant pause before it began all over the rail unrolling towards the river so that's the poem the very first thing we see about the poem is it starts in a very almost like in your face manner very active manner the told that at the instant instant reveals that the person had very limited time like seconds to make a decision and we're told that of drowning now the lack of comma after the word drowning highlights the agency with which the person had to make a decision because when you read the poem it's supposed to be at the instant of drowning comma he invoked the three sisters but we see here that at the instant of drowning he, he invoked the three sisters we see that even Dobson herself was in a rush to show us how you know quickly the, the persona had to make a decision so the use of the word he there tells in the first line reveals to the reader that we are dealing with a male persona and drowning tells us that the man was at the corpse of death he was like at the precipice, he was almost dying. And he was dying because he was in a body of water from which he couldn't stay afloat and he was sort of drinking water. But we're told here that the man does something quite remarkable, even with this short or limited notice that is given. He invoked the three sisters. The use of the word that he invoked or invoked is an apostrophe. 
Apostrophe is when you speak to an unseen creature as if, or an unseen force as if it is present. So you see that a lot in prayers where people speak to God as if God were present. So invoke there is an apostrophe that reveals that the personal sought help by calling out to the physically absent spirit sisters as though they were present. So he invoked them. He called them to, to come to his rescue. And we are told that he called not to any force, but then to the three sisters. In Greek mythology, these three spirits are also called the three fates. They are Cloto, the one who starts man's life and spins it into a thread. Lachesis, she measures the thread of man's life. And then the third sister is Atropos. Atropos is the one that cuts the thread of life, causing death. So the, the, the persona invoked the help of the three sisters because he understood that these three sisters have like the power to control his life and also make sure that he doesn't die. So we see that from the get-go, from in the first stanza, stanza one line one, introduces the theme of superstition. And superstition is a very important theme here because the persona speaks to sis the sisters that were not present. We also see the use of alliteration and sibilance in the first line. And you see that in repetition of the T and S sounds. So at the instance, the three sisters. So the application of the T sound and the sibilant S sound in the three sisters creates the impression that the sisters released a sinister sound while rubbing their hands in glee after hearing the persona's prayer. So we see here that auditory imagery is one of the powerful ideas that is presented by Dobson in the first line. Not only by the man invoking, which would have meant that he had to, you know, we are going to say that we are going to be told that he, cr he cried out. But we see here that even the three sisters sort of reacted to it. So we see the sinister sounds of the witches or the three sisters as they made. Dobson describes the man's action as it was a mistake in the second sentence of the first line. It was a mistake. Mistake, her use of the word mistake suggests that she thinks that the person's action can be easily forgiven. And it can be undone. You know, it's like making a mistake and it can easily, easily be erased. But after a comma, she reveals that. She, she sort of quickly changes her mind and says, an aberration. So from a mistake, which is something that can be easily corrected, Dobson changes her mind and says that the man's action is an aberration. So Dobson changes the mind quickly and describes the person's action as, as an aberration. Her use of the word aberration, a very strong word, reveals that she was very very strongly opposed to the persona's action like the man had sort of acted or had done or committed an abomination something that cannot be easily corrected and this is the, what reveals Dobson, Dobson's tone to the reader so the Dobson's tone is revealed by the words it was a mistake an aberration and that's really important when it comes to speaking about the poem because this is the only part where Dobson sort of injects the opinion from when the poem begins to, as the poem continues to unfold, you see that she's, she just sort of reports the man's experience. She has like no emotional attachment to him or pity or so, or, or, or one way or the, she's almost indifferent to them. She just reports to the reader what's happening to the man. But here we see that she injects what she feels. It was a mistake. It was an aberration tells us that for, for Dobson, she initially thought that the man's actions was something that was could easily be forgiven, but later on she realizes that no, it's not something that can be e easily forgiven, but it's an abomination and the man has to bear responsibility for his action. She continues that to cry out. So it was an aberration for the man to cry out. So cry out provides auditory imagery that suggests that the man's invocation was a heartfelt shout from the deepest recesses of his soul. So he made this call out from the deepest resources of his soul. He cried out for help. And we see the use of enjambment in the first stanza as well. From the second line of the first stanza into the third. For life everlasting. So we see an, an enjambment. For life everlasting. Life everlasting simply means that the man's cry not, was not for to be rescued. But the man instead cried out for immortality. So rather than crying out for help or being rescued from the from drowning the man wanted to live forever and these are some of the consequences of the man's prayer and i think this is the reason why Dobson describes the man's actions as an aberration 
So some of the consequences of the person receiving an everlasting life means, for the three sisters, for example, means that lettuces, the measure of the thread of the man's life would have to draw the thread of the man's life in perpetuity forever because she's supposed to stop in a certain place, but here she has to draw it in, in perpetuity. And then Atropos, who cuts life, is going to be made redundant because she, she cannot cut the man's life to cause death. And that also means that the man would not only sort of outlive his contemporaries, but it means that he will be detecting, the person will be detecting the actions of the gods. He will be telling the gods what to do about his life. It also means that the, pers the persona would effectively become a god himself because he's not going to die just like the gods. So in a way, his cry for life everlasting has a lot of ramifications both in the physical and also in the supernatural or in the in the superstitious world sort of and this is a really striking image and that is why i think that Dobson describes the man's action as an aberration something that the man should never have done in the second stanza we are told like a follow-up of what happens the very first thing we see is that Robson reports that he came up like a cock so it came up as a cock is a simile which provides visual imagery that the man sort of jetted out of the water. It suggests that he was supernaturally taken out of the water without any human help. He didn't do anything, but then without human assistance or effort, he was just jetted out, taken out. And it meant that over, it became uh, sort of like a floatable device. And so he, he, no, longer, um, had, he no longer was, was going to die. So the three sisters actually came to the man's rescue. That's what we see here. And we are told that and back to the river bank. The use of the word and back tells us that the man was in the, at the river bank before. It also creates the impression for me that the man's life was rewound. You know, just like a, a video cassette. The, the three sisters rewound the person's life and threw him back from the water back to the river bank. So it, it's like, you know, you're watching a show and then you're able to rewind the, the life, the, your, the, 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 the show or the movie or whatever you're watching. And that's the same idea that is presented in this first line of the second stanza. And we also see the use of consonants in, the, in, this, in this part as well, and assonance as well. You see that consonance is seen in the repetition of the K sound in like a cock and back to the river bank. So consonance is, you can see that in repetition of the case sound. Consonance is when a, a consonant sound, sound is repeated. And we also see assonance as well. Assonance is the repetition of the vowel sound, the A, E, I, O, U. And we see that in, he came up like a cock and back to the river bank. Both devices combine to create vivid auditory imagery of the persona's rescue and the sound of the persona leaving the water. So it wasn't like some quiet affair. There was sound. There was sound that was being made as the man was ejected out of the water because his his, um, his rescue was carried out by supernatural forces. The very first action the man takes after he leaves the, the the water is put on his clothes in reverse order, and I think this is what introduces the fact that all is done well with the man. Put on his clothes in reverse order. The image is troubling because it raises questions about the personal state of mind. What was a personal state of mind? What it means here is that he was wearing what he was supposed to wear in the wrong order. It appears that the persona has lost his mind. So reverse order creates the visual image of the persona wearing his boxes over his trousers and his undershirts over his shirt. So we see here that the, it creates the, 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 we are told by Dobson that the, with the way Dobson presents the way the man is wearing his dress, it's almost as if the man had lost his mind and was doing things in the wrong way. But it doesn't end there. The last line of the of the stanza reports of the of the tacit stanza reports that he returned to the house. It means that he was at the house before, just like we are told that back to the river bank. Also, so he returned to the house. He had been at the house before. And then the question that sort of comes up here was that is that it was the personal suicidal, or did he just go for a swim? It could be that the person was suicidal and then he got to a particular point in his sort of his push for suicide where he sort of changed his mind. Or it could also be that he just went for a swim and then it was a bad day at the office. In the third stanza, we are told about more, we are provided more details about what happened to the persona in the immediate aftermath of him getting to the house. The very first thing we are told by Dobson is that he suffered. 
He suffered suggests that he experienced psychological and physical pain. And where they, she describes what the man suffered as the enormous agonies of passion. The word enormous there suggests that the person had to endure intense pain. And the pain had to do with agonies of passion. Dobson's use of agonies of passion, especially the plural agonies, suggests that the persona experienced countless manifestations of intense emotional, mental, physical, and other forms of pain. And we are told that one of the ways that this manifested was that he also suggested that the sisters caused the persona to experience their brand of suffering. It was almost as if they were touching him. And in my mind, I think they botched, they botched all his rescue effort and made his life cyclical and made, it, made his life very cumbersome. The word enormous also creates the impression that the three faiths physically placed an intolerable amount of pain on the persona. Enormous, something big. Passion suggests that the persona's pain was nearly Christ-like. When he talks about passion, we talk about the passion of the Christ of Christ. So Christ's death at Calvary for the sins of the world and how he had to suffer, how he was beaten, beaten, how he was he was he was scourged with metal. So I think it's that same idea that she, um, Dobson is trying to present here by saying that the man suffered the enormous agonies of passion. And the very first way that it manifested was writing poems from the end backwards. Writing points from the end backwards also reveals that the persona was essential. Uh, um, uh, uh, the persona's poem was essentially a mismatch of random words that constituted gibberish. So sometimes, if you see where maybe people have like um, challenges, mental challenges, sometimes they tend to scribble. You know, the man was just scribbling nonsense, and he was scribbling from the end backwards. Which means that if you picked the man's poem and you are reading it from the from the beginning to the end. It will be it will make no sense and so these are some of the ideas so as a poet he, he was writing gibberish and nonsense from the end backward also indicates that he wrote poems with a final alphabet of the last word first to the first alphabet of the first word last so it, it's essentially mean that it was sort of it was it was being rewound his life was being rewound and everything was writing made no sense she continues that brushing away tears that have not yet fallen. That's the third tacit. Or the ninth line. Brushing away tears that have not yet fallen. The action presents the person as someone that was mentally disturbed. So if you're brushing away tears that have not yet fallen, it means that you're experiencing emotions before, or you are sort of reacting to emotions before you actually experience these emotions. So it was brushing away tears that are not yet fallen. The characteristics of the persona struggle as brushing, the, sorry, the characterization of the persona struggle as brushing away tears that had not yet fallen suggests that the man experienced intense emotions that would cause him to shed tears, like physically shed tears, long before he leads to the experiences or the experience that causes him to, to cry. So imagine the image of the man standing and then wiping the, the under his eyes. As if he's, he's crying and he's, he's not yet he's not crying yet and that kind of image will present the man as somebody who has like a mental problem and the use of the word brushing provides that type image of the persona wiping under his face a physical the man is wiping under his, 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 his face for tears that are not yet falling in the fourth stanza we are there's a there's a bit of a shift in the in the in the setting but the first thing we are told is, is that um, Dawson introduces a second persona, a female persona. He says, loving her. Loving her introduces a female persona. Loving the present continuous tense of, of love indicates that the, the love consumed the persona's mind. So he was daily, constantly in love with this female persona. Loving also suggests that he felt an intense unbridled sense of affection for the unnamed female persona he loved her and he couldn't control himself it was almost as if it was devouring the inside of him Dawson des describes the way with, in which he loves he, he loved this female persona as wildly wildly suggests that the love was untamed and it was growing where it wasn't needed that's why it's described as wildly so wildly suggests that the, the the persona's love was is an untamed when something is growing wildly it means that it's growing in a place where it is not planted wildly also presents the love as unacceptable and perverted 
It also makes his love come across as animalistic and predatory. So it's almost as if the kind of love that the persona was feeling after he was, he was rescued for this female persona was predatory. Like, you know, he was trying to, he was loving somebody that he shouldn't love. Essentially, the word makes it seem like he pursues the unnamed female persona for his selfish gain and with an ulterior motive. So later on, I think the idea that is also presented is the idea of pedophilia and all of that because it talks about how the day regressed. But we are going to get to, we are going to explain that a bit more when, as we as we progress. She continues that as the day regressed towards morning, so it was almost as if the day was undoing itself. As the day regressed towards morning, regress suggests that even the forces of nature, like morning or day, was fighting against the persona. Regress suggests that even the forces of nature, which the poet symbolizes as the day, work against the persona. It was fighting against him. It wanted to make sure that he doesn't sort of achieve or get into this love affair with the object of his affection. Regress creates the impression that nature undid itself. So think of the day from maybe afternoon and then it is on, it's been unwound or rewinding itself. Regress creates the impression that nature undid itself by rewinding towards morning. So if it was later on in the day, it was rather undoing itself. Now this is a striking image because we see here that the the, the 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 man's life had essentially become like he's being rewound, and this is happening to ensure that the persona's attraction to the female persona does not materialize and that it undoes all that the persona has achieved. If your life is, is um, regresses or your, the days of your life regresses, what it means is that everything you've achieved is going to be undone, and that's what happens with the persona. So even nature was fighting against him. I think that's the, that whole idea of the aberration bit is made more powerfully here. Regress also suggests that the day became worse for the man. So even though the day was already bad for him, you know, he was writing poems from the end backwards, he was suffering enormous agonies of passion, brushing away tears that are not yet falling, but it was still, it, 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 it got worse for him. The day regressed. So regress also suggests that the day became worse for the man and he experienced even more extreme forms of torture and more difficult challenges. And the very first thing we are told is that the day also, regress also, it also means that the day became younger. So everything was growing younger except him and everything was sort of going against him. We con it continues that he watched her. The use of the word he watched her reveals the existence of distance between the persona and his love interest. So there's a distance between them. So he was standing at a, at a distance and he was watching her. And when he was watching her, that presents him like a stalker. So he stands from afar and then he's looking out to this uh, female persona. And she, she's having like a carefree or, uh, you know, the, the, the best time of her life, swinging in the garden. His love interest is enjoying a carefree life as in, and, and she's also oblivious to his presence. So it's almost like this idea of unrequited love here. So he loves her, but she doesn't even know that he exists. Growing younger. Growing younger means that a youth was being renewed. She was becoming fresher and fresher. It also indicates a widening of the age gap between them. That's why I'm, from in my mind, I think that, you know, it introduces the theme of pedophilia as well. Like pedophilia in the sense that he was going to love a girl that is underage. That's something that society would frown on. And she was growing younger. So he was essentially, the, the Triffids not only made him go through emotional torture and um, unrequited love, but now they're also trying to present him like a pedophile to, to, you know, to wider society. And we are told here that she's barefoot and straw-hearted. Barefoot symbolizes innocence and being in tune with nature. So the, the, the persona's love interest was in tune with nature. So nature is fighting against the persona, the day is regressing towards the morning, but then on the other hand, his love interest is barefoot and she's having the time of her life. Straw hearted also shows that it's like for the, for the female persona or for the persona's love interest, life was a vacation for her and she did not have a care in the world, so she was having a blast, the best time of her, her life while he was going through mental torture. And he was also being um, sort of attacked or um, impeded by all the forces of nature. The fifth um, tacit of the poem say, begins with the word and. So all of these things are happening and then and. 
and suggest a building on the previous action. So, and there are things that the personal loses here. It says, and when she was gone, so the personal lost four things. She, that means the object of his, um, of his love. And then he also lost the house. Remember, it was the house that he went to, where he returned to in the second stanza. And the swing, which I think is also something that is important because that's what his love interest was swinging on. And then daylight itself. So it was almost as if one by one, these objects were being dragged out of the persona's view. She was gone suggests that the persona's love interest had vaporized into thin air and was no longer within his reach. So she was gone. The house, the house is, was a, is a place where the persona found solace. After meeting the three fates, losing it signifies the loss of the persona's place in the world. So even his place in the world is lost because of the kind of interaction that he had with the three sisters. And then we also told that the swing, I think the swing would have been an, something that would have served as, you know, um, um, you know, like something sentimental, a, a sentimental object to him. And that too was also lost, was also gone. So the three fates not only took the, 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 his love interest and the house that was supposed to be a place of solace for him, but even things that were going to be of sentimental value to the persona was also taken. It was almost as if they were going to do as much damage to his psyche as possible. And the last thing that he loses is daylight. The loss of daylight as the last, the man, as the last thing that the persona lost creates the effect that he looked on as one thing after the other vanished. So he, he, the, there was daylight and then he lost the, his love interest, he lost his house, and then he also lost the swing. And then finally, he was thrown into an abyss of darkness. And we also see the use of climax here, where Dobson presents the things that the man lost in increasing levels of importance. So she is the most important thing, followed by the house, and then followed by the swing. And then the final thing is that he's just thrown into complete and total darkness, like an a base of darkness. We also see the repetition of and in the first line of the first stanza. And the repetition of and, and is actually repeated four times in this line. And is repeated four times in the line before she, house, swing, and daylight to emphasize the persona's losses. So in effect, he lost four things at once. It also creates the effect that each item vanished one after the other. So she was gone, the house, the swing, and then daylight. The reputation of and also highlights the unique importance of each item to the persona. His love interest, his house, the sentimental swing, and then finally the daylight. Then we are told that there was an instant pause. We see that the word instant is repeated, the second time is being repeated in the poem. An instant suggests that the pause occurred within an imperceptibly short time that was almost impossible to notice. So while he was there, suddenly there was this instant pause, this very um, uh, imperceptible pause. And we see the word instant repeated in the first line of the first stanza as a third word, and then also the word instant repeated as the fourth word of the, um, the fifth stanza, the, the fourth word of the fifth stanza in the second line. So the repetition emphasizes the, 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 the short notice with which sometimes the persona has to react. And then we are told that there was a pause. A pause indicates that time was halted or frozen or brought to a standstill. So imagine that you've, you, the man had lived his life to a certain point and now there's a pause. An imperceptible pause. And we are told that before it began all over. So all the experiences that a persona has experienced is going to be repeated again. So I think that the three sisters, in fact, made their persona's life cyclical. What that means is like his life was a cycle. So it plays to a certain beginning and then it goes back to the end and then it goes back. So it's, it's, it's cyclical. So the, the, the replay of the persona's life from the beginning. And we're told that the real unrolling towards the river. The use of the word real reduces the, the man's life or the persona's life to a copy of a movie. So, or a, a, a copy of a movie, a video cassette. It also suggests that his life became cased into a movie real from which he will never escape. So the man's life has become a real. You know, most people have like, you know, life from point A to point B. 
but his life is cyclical, which means is that which means that he plays his life from point A to point B, but then B and A meet at a point, and he has to repeat and go over and over. So he has to leave this his live experience, you know, in perpetuity. So real is a metaphor for the man's life. Unrolling provides imagery of the persona's life. Unrolling provides visual imagery that the persona's life was being unwound or re re rewound and allowed to replay, roll back to the to the end. So it's almost as if his life falls and then he has to roll back to the end and then he has to now come back. The real unrolling towards the river. Remember, all of these things happens or begins with the, the persona drowning. We see here that it's now going back. Everything is now going back from where it began towards the river where everything began. So it effectively means that the man has to live his life over and over and over again. We also see for the second time the um, use of alliteration and consonants in the poem as well. The poet alliterates the T and arrow sounds in the last line of the poem. Alliteration is seen in the, towards the. So the repetition of the T, T sound. Alliteration is also is also seen in the the towards there, and it alliterates the arrow sound in real and river. So while the man's life is being unwound or is being is rolling towards the river, it's making a sound. So we, we hear visual image. Um, sorry, we hear auditory imagery of the sound of the man's life being rewound. Remember, we talked about auditory imagery in the introductory paragraph when we talked about the word invoked, and we also talked about the word cried out. So we see that noise is, is, a, is a very powerful, or auditory imagery is a powerful um, device that Dobson used to, uses to present the persona's life. Consonance is evidenced by the word unrolling towards. Both poetic devices provide auditory imagery of the tape of the persona's life as it unrolls. The sharp sound produces a sense of tension and strain that seeps into the persona's life. So, Dawson uses sound as something that one of the things that the, the persona has to contend with. So some of the themes of the poem include superstition, trusting in spirit. Some people trust in faith, the pitiful force of immortality, the negatives of everlasting life, and then to live in the moment. It's almost as if Dawson is sort of indirectly informing the reader that live in the moment, capidium, seize the day. And she wants the reader to seize the day because Trying to live um, forever is something that could be cumbersome and could lead to a lot of suffering and pain. Now, when it comes to the IGCSCS, most of the questions usually revolve around the themes. So you can be asked, how does um, Rob, um, Rosemary Dobson powerfully present or strikingly present the pitfalls of immortality in the poem, The Three Faces? Or how does Rosemary Dobson powerfully present the... the, 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 the Challenges that a person has to deal with in the poem, The Three Feats. Now, when it comes to the structure of the poem, we see that the poem is in tacit stanzas, so three line stanzas. The poem structure of three line stanzas or tacit keeps the idea of three, used in the description of the three sisters, at the forefront of the reader's mind. Remember, we are talking about the three feats. So, the, the tacit stanza keeps that in our mind. So, three, 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 three. So it sort of falsifies or crazy idea that the man's life is actually, you know, being run in the normal way or it has like some logic to it. But when you go into it deeply, you realize that there's no logic. The first line of each stanza draws out an idea. The second line spins or builds up on the idea that is presented in the first line. And the third line concludes or ends the idea. So the the, the third stanza sort of copies the the ideas or the, 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 what we see in the, that is being done in the, in the, with the three sisters. The idea of cutting is seen in the use of end punctuation or full stop at the end of all three, of all the third stanzas in, um, all the third lines of each stanza. So the poem is actually cut at the end. There's a full stop to show that the poem has come to an end. If you enjoy this lesson, you can actually purchase the course that provides all 15 poems um, analyze to minute details. The course allows you to customize how you learn, so you can decide to begin with each, any of the poem poems. The po the course also has stanza by stanza, line by line, and then word for word analysis of all the fifteen poems. Some of the ideas I've not gone to into deeply um, into detail enough because of the time constraint. But there you're going to see ideas that are even giving three, four um, explanations, and that's going to be really helpful for for you when it comes to writing in the IGCSE. 
You can also find analysis of the pros and drama components on Mr. Quaker's teachers as well. Dot com. So on characters, themes, conflicts, other ideas, and on information on the unseen paper can also be found at mrquakersteaches.com. You can also visit Mr. Quaker's teachers to book private tuition in the Cambridge IGCSE and A level in English language, English literature, geography, and history. Or you can join our tribe on Mr. Quaker's teachers IGCSE literature on Telegram. Now, until next time, so you have it here. The poem, The Three Faced by Rosemary Dobson, has been demystified. R leave your comments and questions in the description box. Bye bye.